This is a production of Cornell University. All right, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my, I am Chris Smart, if there are folks that don't know me, uh, professor of vegetable pathology in the section of plant pathology and plant microbiology in SIPS. And it is my pleasure today to introduce Marjorie Daughtry, who is working towards her PhD degree in ornamental plant pathology. Um, Marjorie is a senior extension associate at um, the Long Island Horticulture HR Research and Extension Center. <laughs> um, and uh, actually they recently celebrated their 100 year anniversary. And I think um, Marjorie was highlighted in many of the celebratory activities. Marjorie got her uh, bachelor's at the College of William and Mary, uh, master's of science at the University of Massachusetts. She has re received many accolades uh, over the years, has been very involved in the American Phytopathological Society. Uh, where she served as editor in chief, uh, as well as she became a fellow of our society in 2012. She has also recently received the CALS Award for Outstanding Accomplishments in Extension and Outreach by an Individual. And one of the really cool things that I am highly envious of is that Marjorie has a plant pathogen named after her. And there are really very few plant pathologists who, that have that distinction. And uh, Marjorie's pathogen is an Olmyce, which is near and dear to my heart. Uh, the name is Hyloperinospora dotrii. Is, is that how you pronounce that, Marjorie? That's how I pronounce it. But, uh, you know, <laughs> for, for the next generations, people will probably be mispronouncing it. <laughs> so. um, and, and as I said, there are very few. One of the things um, that I would like to highlight uh, is in the naming of that, it came out in uh, a paper in 2020. It said, uh, this is dedicated to Marjorie L. Daughtry who collected the samples and has made significant contributions to the field of ornamental plant pathology, especially in the area of downy mildew diseases, which is really cool. Marjorie has also uh, given a talk as a person of distinction to the American Phytopathological Society at our annual meeting. And that is the video that we will see today. Following the video, um, there will be a chance for folks to ask, ask questions. And then after that, the committee will go into a exam. So with that, Marjorie, you can start us up. Okay, great. Um, I could say some of the same things, but um, Chris did a beautiful introduction. Thank you so much. And um, I did prepare the video that you're about to see two years ago in the middle of the pandemic. You'll see how long my hair is. And um, it it talks about my career. And then I will invite all of you to talk more with me about my career after that's finished. So it just leaps right in. So let's push go here. Hello, everyone. I'm Marjorie Daughtry, a senior extension associate with Cornell University. And I've been asked to give a pod talk to you on learning plant pathology one disease at a time which is how I found it to be. Um, I have a bachelor's degree from the College of William & Mary and a master's from UMass Amherst. And I've been working for Cornell University since 1978 here on Long Island, at the Long Island Horticultural Research and Extension Center. And I do specialize in ornamental plants or as Christy Palmer would have me say, environmental horticulture plants. This is a photograph of the crew here at the LIHREC or LIREC. And um, you will recognize some of the folks here perhaps. Mark Bridgen, our director is here front and center. And then Meg McGrath is here in the third row. She does the vegetable pathology here. I do the ornamentals pathology. There was a time when I did not know that plant diseases existed. And I'm sure this is true for all of the rest of you as well. Uh, here's a photograph of me with my parents back in the early 1950s, uh, looking very innocent that there is such a thing as plant disease. I was raised in Crozet, Virginia, in this house that is nestled at the foot of the Blue Ridge Mountains. They were always there to look at. Um, this is a town that is very famous for its peaches, and it has a historic marker because the town is named after the French railway engineer 
who built the first tunnel through the Blue Ridge Mountains. Here's a photo of my grandmother in her garden, uh, looking at her camellia and wisteria. The um, grandfathers in my family were certainly farmers, but the women in my family have always been especially oriented towards ornamental plants. Here's a photograph of my Aunt Bobby and me in her garden about 1956. Um, and again, I think I'm still unaware that there's such a thing as a plant disease. But eventually, we all meet up with one, and you always remember your first. For me, it was this one on azalea. It's a disease called pinkster gall, and it's caused by Exobacidium japonicum. I met this disease about 1974, so a good part of my life had been lived before I even knew there was such a thing as plant pathology. But I looked up those really curious galls in a book in my aunt's basement, and I was off and running after that. Uh, one of the things that this disease led me to was a long-term friendship with Henriette Soor, uh, a fantastic lady with a fantastic garden called Rocky Hills in Westchester County. And she had many, many wonderful azaleas, but she also had the disease called pinkster gall. And I was happy to be able to teach her that if she removed the galls while they were still green before they turned white, as in this little inset, um, she would be able to control the disease because the basidia spores would not have been produced. So the many lessons that I've learned about being a plant pathologist since I first met the Exobacidium, and I'll share some of those with you today because there are a number of uh, school teachers in my background as well. I like teaching people things. Um, one is that sidekicks are essential. Uh, this is my childhood friend, Susan Milius, who also went on to a career that involves science and writing. And uh, I'm on the right here, and we had the benefit of prowling through 40 acres that her parents owned in Virginia uh, to explore nature as children, and that certainly fed into my future career. And then in later life, I had some phytopathological sidekicks. Uh, two of my favorites are shown here, Mary Hausbeck and Ann Chase, and you can also see Larry Barnes there in the background, another fantastic extension pathologist to work with. Mary, I have worked with in many capacities having to do with research on downy mildew and powdery mildew in particular. Uh, we would uh, meet up at Society of American Florists events and have plotted a lot of research together, and we're currently continuing to work on the downy mildew of impatience today. And here I am with Anne in New York City. Anne has always said that I make up things for her to do, but I think she makes up things for me to do. And in reality, we come up with projects together and enjoy doing them together very much because it's, it's just much more interesting to bounce ideas off of one another. One of our first projects together was the book that's shown open here, uh, which is the uh, Ball Field Guide to Diseases. And uh, that was followed fairly soon after by a book that we um, also pulled Gary Simone in on, which was Diseases of Annuals and Perennials. Since then, we've done many trade um, trade magazine articles, uh, including this one here on ranunculus diseases, and we've always both been very interested in providing illustrations to help people identify the problems that they're facing in the greenhouse industry. Our most recent effort was the Compendium of Bedding Plant Diseases and Pests, which we did with Ray Cloyd, and that's uh, still fairly hot off the press at APS. Um, earlier collaborators included the fantastic Rob Wick and Joe Peterson, with whom I did the Compendium of Flowering Potted Plant Diseases, and we also owe Bruce, Bruce Clark for getting us into that project in the first place. Your colleagues really should be your friends, if you can possibly manage that. Yes, there's some competition, but at least in the ornamentals area, uh, we need one another a lot more than we need to compete with one another. Um, here are two of the people that I think made that easy for me. Uh, first of all, Ron Jones, and followed by Mike Benson. There has been this marvelous ornamentals workshop held in the mountains of North Carolina every other year for quite some time. I first went there to tell them about the dogwood anthracnose disease, and they laughed at it and thought of it as a Yankee disease, only to later on find out they needed to have paid attention, unfortunately. But this group of people gets together um, and has a very great sharing time. Um, with many different projects and observations being discussed. And when you're with people in a remote facility and having breakfast, lunch, and dinner with them, you can really trade a lot of good information and learn to trust one another. So we've, we've developed great relationships through this particular workshop that we've had working for us as ornamentals pathologists. 
it's also really important to have mentors. I have only three shown here, but I have many more certainly. Uh, Ralph Freeman at the upper left was a phenomenal extension agent here in Suffolk County. He was the floriculture specialist and he taught me everything I know about extension. Jay Stipes, many of you know, certainly taught me everything I know about elm trees, but also his enthusiasm is incredibly infectious. So I'm sure he's given me some of that as well. And Dr. Martin C. Mathis was one of my professors at William and Mary. And uh, I learned plant physiology from him. And I also learned the value of a good pun um, and also the value of a bad pun, as a matter of fact. And he's still sharing those with me on Facebook today. Um, it's also very important to have helpers, the people who don't necessarily travel around the world with you, but who get the work done when you're traveling around the world. Um, currently, Paulina Richlick and Lynn Hyatt are working for me as research support specialists. And in the past, Yadviga and Maria and Barbara and Sue and Jamie have done terrific jobs for me as well. Robert Kent is a special person, my mate of many years. He's in charge of love and emotional support as well as advice and amusement for me. And he has certainly earned the title of junior plant pathologist. He's absorbed a lot of it over the years from, from hanging out with me. In ag extension, you certainly need a very supportive industry. And I found the nursery and greenhouse industries to be extremely good at that. They really care about plant pathology and they're interested in what I have to say. Uh, you also need like-minded extension folk because it takes often more than one person to get a message across or to plan a meeting. And um, shown here are some of the ones that I get to work with now in New York, uh, Nora Catlin and Mina Vicera and Dan Gilrain and Betsy Lamb. Uh, and there are a number of others who just create great teamwork potential for us. The growers themselves are also really important. Um, we think of them as perhaps needing our information, but in reality, we need them. Uh, we want to teach about plant disease, and we need them to really care about it. And uh, I found this to, to be a very nice two-way interaction. They have much to teach me about how they grow their crop, and hopefully I can occasionally help them when they're having a small crisis of something that's a contagious disease. It's also nice to be able to share with growers the triumph of getting a crop through to the end and having it not disease-ridden. Um, you can share the, uh, the fears and then uh, also share the, the triumph when a control program has actually worked for a grower. I also think you need diagnosis to learn by. I've done a great deal of diagnosis over the years and find I'm learning something, if not every day, at least every week, uh, just from that constant exposure to questions of what's going on with my plant. Some of the plant disease eras in my career have um, been um, interesting along the way, and I'll share some of those with you. Uh, my master's was actually not done with ornamental plants at all. The, um, the lab focused on, plant, on Erwinia caritavra, variety caritavra at that time. And uh, I was looking at the plasmids in that bacterium under Mark Mount. Um, I'm calling this a cabbage pathology project because that was where his source of funding was from. Um, later on, I found that uh, soft rot also goes to ornamentals. It certainly goes to poinsettias. And recently, we've looked at a dickia disease that is affecting New Guinean patients. Dogwoods came into play very soon after I moved to Long Island to start my job. In the late 1970s, we had a disease that uh, we called dogwood lower branch dieback at first and later on realized was an anthracnose. So dogwood anthracnose was named um, uh, and also the pathogen was named on, on my watch. Discula destructiva was Scott Redland's wonderful name for, for the pathogen. And we learned a lot about it in a short time because it took the dogwood by storm. Um, here we have Craig Hibben, who was my research partner in this work. Um, he and George Hudler and I published together on the disease. Um, and also I work with Manfred Milkey with Forest Service. I'm getting out a, a pest alert on the problem. And here you see the naked tree that Craig was quite famous for. He and his technician stripped all the bark off to show how the cankers of the disease accumulate on the trunk. This uh, particular disease had a fairly happy ending in that plant breeders at uh, the University of Tennessee and also at Rutgers were able to develop plants that were relatively resistant to the problem. Uh, here you see Appalachian Joy and Karen's Appalachian Blush, which are two of the Tennessee varieties. And you see Ina there, Alan Wyndham's dog, wondering when someone's going to name a dogwood after her. 
geraniums were also a very important crop uh, in the, the greenhouse industry during my early years. And uh, the biggest disease for them was this bacterial blight disease caused by Xanthomonas. It could cause individual leaf spots, but the spots could then spread into wedges, move into the vascular system and kill the plants. So it was the most terrifying thing that a grower would face in my early years. Today, it's been replaced by Ralstonia solanaceorum, uh, which is considered to be the most ferocious thing that a geranium grower can face because of the possibility of regulatory action against the race three biovar two type of that pathogen. The uh, xanthomonas disease was able to affect both the ivy geranium, as you see at the left there, and also perennial geranium species, uh, the hardy geraniums. But there's a big difference in the symptoms as you go across these different kinds of geranium. The uh, hardy geranium can be quite a uh, source of inoculum for the other crops because the symptoms are very minimal. You'll just have leaf spots when the hardy geranium is infected. So sharing that kind of information was what took me to the international geranium conferences um, in State College in Odense, Denmark. And I was also able to work with um, Steve Namath and Gary Mormon and Mike Slozinski from Pennsylvania on a feature article uh, that talked about this particular disease and how we really need clean stock to fight back against it. Oh, and did I mention that at um, Crossnor, we always dressed up as our favorite pathogens. And so you could tell what I was working on by what pathogen I was wearing in any given year. This one is obviously a xanthomonas cell, and you can see my flagellum. Unfortunately, I couldn't see, so Ethel Dutke, who's the person there in the deer costume, was leading me around all night to make sure I didn't break my neck. Another thing that geraniums are prone to is pythium root rot. And uh, so over the years, there have been a number of people who focused on the pythium and trying to reduce that in greenhouses. Gary Mormon and San Juan Kim were involved in the early years. And then Carla Garzone at the left there has been taking up that particular job in recent years to minimize pythium problems in greenhouses. Tospoviruses became very important from the 1980s on. And by this, I'm referring to impatience necrotic spot virus, which was the first one to trouble the, green, the greenhouse industry. Um, examples of that are at the, uh, across the bottom of this slide. And then up at the top, you see three examples of tomato spotted wilt virus affecting greenhouse crops, um, because actually in recent years, TSWV has been more common in the greenhouses than INSV. They're, they're both thrips vectored, and we have a hard time with thrips management in greenhouses. This also has, to some degree, gotten me around the world because one of the international symposia on tospoviruses and thrips was held in Taiwan in 1995. And um, also, I've had the opportunity to write about it, uh, particularly with the North Carolina crew, again, a feature article talking about tospoviruses as they were moving into and having a strong effect in the greenhouse industry. In the early 1990s, a new problem arose in poinsettias. Uh, there had never been a powdery mildew problem in poinsettias before, but it became um, an instant new thing. And if it had just limited itself to the foliage, it would have been one thing, but it decided that it would move quite happily into bracts, knowing full well as a fungus that it was um, just working on a modified leaf. And so we had a problem that would travel from production right into um, lobbies and uh, schools and churches and really needed to be controlled from early in the crop production. So that was a huge effort of extension. Uh, Jan Hall and I did an article for Grower Talks, one of the, the leading uh, magazines for the greenhouse trade uh, to tell the growers about the problem. Um, I worked here with my technician at the time on evaluating different fungicidal controls. Uh, we wrote about this and other diseases in a article that Mike Benson put together. And recently, um, I've done an, an article, um, a chapter in the Handbook of Florist Crop Diseases that Bob McGovern and Wade Elmer have been have edited um, with Ann Chase talking about all the different problems that can happen to the poinsettia. Uh, but you'll see here once again that at Crossnor, we tend to dress as whatever pathogen we're working on. There was a herbaceous perennials boom that came about the turn of the century as growers look for new crops. And uh, Mark Gleason had up, headed up a really interesting effort to put together a book that held all the information about the diseases. And I was happy to be part of that project. Again, this is an APS Press book. Um, about 2004, 
we started seeing something new in impatience, which had been a leading crop since the 1960s. And uh, this had a huge impact um, because first of all, it was hard to identify instead of having individual spots, it tended to cause very systemic infections that would stunt leaves and make leaves fall off the plant. Uh, so for a while there, I was having a challenge in the diagnostic lab, wondering what these sticks were that people were mailing to me for diagnosis. Um, then about 2012, it became perfectly obvious what it was and it became a huge problem in the landscape. Uh, you could see coatings of the downy mildew sporulation on the underside of the leaves and the newspapers started reporting on it uh, primarily in 2012, 2013. And we found what a powerful tool for extension a newspaper can be uh, compared to the efforts we're ordinarily able to make. Uh, the disease did not respect the plant whatsoever. This is an illustration of one at my local Panera uh, taken on September 15th. And then if you look back on October 11th, the plants have been just destroyed. Leaves have fallen off, flowers have fallen off. Um, the stems are thinking of falling over. And here in a photograph of Alan Wyndham's, you see stems that have keeled over. And we learned early on that the oospores that the impatient downy mildew produces last in the soil to continue the possibility for infection in future years. Um, this was done largely through some very meticulous work by Nana Shishka. So we knew that plant breeding was going to be the ultimate answer. And fortunately, in the past few years, uh, efforts have been made uh, by the different plant breeding companies that have been successful. And these three plants in this image are showing you two of the previous types of white impatiens that were on the market, the accents and the super alphans that are terribly susceptible to the disease, and then a resistant plant at the bottom grown in the same trial under the same conditions with the same inoculum. Uh, now we have the Beacon series from Ball Pan Am and the Imera XDR series from Syngenta, both of which have high resistance to downy mildew. At about the same time that the impatiens were getting struck by downy mildew, we had boxwood blight appearing in the uh, Northeast and in the South on the East Coast of the United States. And uh, this is one of the first plants that was brought to me, uh, a boxwood having a bad hair day. And that's one of its cardinal symptoms is the dropping of leaves from infected um, plants. There is a leaf spot phase to the disease. And also there are stem cankers where the pathogen can sporulate. And we found this disease had begun about 10 years earlier in the UK without us really being all that aware of it. I'm paying a lot more attention to what happens in, in the, the EU now because actually we have so much trade that problems move around the world very quickly. Uh, we saw when we visited London for a symposium that the RHS put together a lot of evidence of the infection in public plantings on boxwood. Uh, back home, we've certainly seen a lot of problem in the, the Hamptons and in other areas of southeastern New York where the disease tends to cause this defoliation uh, under our fairly wet climate. Uh, there's been a lot of effort to do research on the disease that has been fairly well funded up till now and has recently received an SCRI grant under Chuan Hong to, to go further. Uh, but we've done what we can to learn about the disease and there will be coming up in Plan Health Progress a diagnostic guide to boxwood blight very, very shortly. The latest thing is a disease on beech trees. This began happening in the uh, area around uh, Lake County, Ohio, a number of years ago, and now has spread to affect us in the eastern part of New York State. Uh, there's intervenal banding and also stunted rugose leaves on the trees. And this has been associated with a nematode living in the foliage and um, other scientists at USDA and in Ohio have been able to inoculate buds of beech and recreate these symptoms. Uh, these are some of the nematodes that I pulled out from foliage that's only about 10 miles from my office and I fully expect it to be across the street any day now. My inspiration through much of my career has been from Cynthia Westcott, who was known as the plant doctor. Uh, she was born in 1898 and um, she studied at Cornell and that's where her PhD is from. She wrote a fantastic autobiography called uh, Plant Doctoring is Fun that any of you would enjoy reading. And she's been much honored. She was called a horticultural hero by the Tower Hill Botanic Garden recently. And they actually named a rose after her. I think this is the greatest of tributes when an industry recognizes a plant pathologist by associating her name with something positive. Um, I have, however, recently had a 
a similar, if not quite as nice fate, in that um, Cleome began to show symptoms um, several years ago in this area, and I shared these symptoms with some of my friends at uh, Beltsville, and um, they turned this into a paper, and in the course of working out the fact that there was a new species of downy mildew involved with the Cleome symptoms, they decided to name it after me. So now I have the pleasure of knowing that there is a Hyalo Paranospora Daughtryi out there, just as hard to spell and say as many of the other diseases. Uh, but when you run across this disease, please think of me. I think it's just fantastic to, to have something named after me, even if it's not a rose. So uh, I'll leave you with that, and I understand there might be some questions afterwards. Thanks so much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Marjorie. Uh, if there are questions, you can uh, raise your hand and unmute. Ask any questions you may have. If you're very shy, you could write a Adam? chat question. Adam. Where can I get that Xanthamona suit? <laughs> I do believe that is in my closet. Um, I also have um, one of my poinsettia powdery mildew costumes is also available. Um, and I, I don't think I'd even charge a fee. <laughs> Thanks. A more serious question, you know, and this comes from our, our work together on the Xanthomonas uh, <clears throat> cannabis, right, that you found in poinsettia. Um, and you know, there are times when uh, the disease origin may be, you know, uh, in this case, it was, uh, I think, Kenya, maybe, potentially, right? Where they... Was Ethiopia, it? close. Ethiopia, okay, yeah, right. And then you mentioned the boxwood in, in England. Um, to what extent have you found it, have you found people in countries of origin for, uh, you know, <clears throat> exotic diseases, um, amenable to collaboration. Mm, interesting. I mean, have question. there been restraints that, that they face, you know, politically or otherwise with their government in terms of trade restrictions that sort of tie their hands or has it always been fairly smooth? Uh, very interesting question, Adam. The um, thing that I have often thought is that, gee, it's too bad it's in that country. I don't know anyone there. I don't have a pathologist colleague that I can just call up and discuss it with. So it is harder for communication, certainly. Um, there's usually an American company that is working with any of these more foreign locations. So I generally tend to connect through whoever the person is that I know here with the company. And they put me in touch with someone who is at least a part-time pathologist. But often I feel like there aren't enough pathologists on the other side. <laughs> Um, and if they're from the Netherlands, they don't like to talk about it. They're very good at keeping their cards close to their chest. Um, so there is a, a reduced communication feature that goes with these kinds of outbreaks that are global. And I think it's going to be an important challenge to break that down because there's such a time delay when you don't have the ability to talk about what might have gone wrong from very early in the process. Mm -hmm. Further questions? Um, I'd like to ask a question. This is Dan. Um, Marge, can you comment on your the support you provided uh, to departments of ag and other entities outside of just growers? I mean, you mentioned a little bit about you know the propagator issue from overseas, but comment a little on that. Well, that's one of the collaborations that I didn't give a whole lot of discussion to because if you want to be an effective extension professional, you don't emphasize a regulatory aspect to your life uh, because you want trust with the grower and you want not to betray that trust and you don't want to be leading them into uh, some type of serious quarantine situation uh, through any kind of mistake, certainly. Um, but the reality is that in New York, we don't have a pathologist per se with our Department of Ag and Markets. So one of the things that I do in my job is to serve as their pathologist uh, for consultation and for training of their workforce. They have uh, state horticultural inspectors that go out into all the nurseries and greenhouses periodically and are looking for the most important and serious problems that might appear there. 
So um, that's one of the more important educational roles that I have. It's it's one person at a time when you're talking to a grower, but when you're addressing the entire port inspector workforce, you're getting points across to everyone who's out there as a watchdog, and that's that's really very meaningful. So um, I've worked directly with them uh, many times um, over the years, and certainly each time we get a new disease problem, uh, that relationship shows back up again. Uh, recently, I was teaching them how to identify the symptoms of bacterial blight on geraniums again, because that disease came back for us last year. Um, and it's it's good to have that relationship. They're very good in the reverse direction as well. They keep me informed as to what's going on. So that's a very nice working relationship. And I, I appreciate it very much. Um, there are also some things that go beyond that so that um, I've had a few interactions with the National Plant Board or with the, um, the Port Authority folks who are examining material coming in and out of the country sort of by way of the New York State uh, Department of Ag and Markets. So that's that means that things that um, I've gathered, such as a good collection of illustrations of things like um, images of Ralstonia on geranium, can be shared with a group of people whose job it is to be able to identify it. So that's that's been a very useful part of, of my work, I think. There's a great question in chat, Marjorie. Tell me mm. to read it or... Oh, I can. A I can few of the most important recommendations that you would give to a developing plant pathologist, uh, important things that you might have learned or a culture that you have observed that needs to be carried on to future generations. <laughs> well, um, there are a lot of things. That's that's a long discussion. <laughs> um, but you know, some of them were emphasized in that video, so I'll I'll just repeat the key things. I I'm a real believer in networking, and. Um, you need to find the people that are very knowledgeable who can help you. And you need to then give immediately out to, to others who are younger or less experienced than you. Uh, so it's a very continuous process. Mm -hmm. um, those kinds of relationships are what helps me to be more helpful. Uh, for example, people tell me things. Um, the perspective in that video is interesting to me, for example, because it talks about that long ago disease of powdery mildew on a poinsettia. Well, a, a grower contacted me yesterday with powdery mildew on a poinsettia. I haven't seen it for 12 or 20 years, but it's back again. And without the, the interaction, it would just fester somewhere in some faraway county and no one would realize it until maybe next year it came back much stronger. So um, I think anything that develops lines of communication is really important for you, both in terms of finding good jobs uh, through the contacts of these other people, but also finding information because each pathologist has to specialize. These days, I'm probably the closest thing to a generalist you'll ever meet, but um, so many of the people that have helped me in my career have been very good at bacterial diseases or very good at virus diseases and um, you know, maybe very good at Gerbera problems. So I, I do find it really helpful to know the folks who are specialized in many different areas. And I think just sitting in your own little laboratory with your own lab bench is not going to get you as far as, as reaching out, participating in APS is one really wonderful thing too. Um, I, focus more on the um, Krasnor experience in that video because I was um, presenting it at APS. So everyone there uh, knew that APS was important, but um, I would repeat that your professional society is really important. Uh, the Northeast Regional Society has been a fantastic backup for me as well, again, because of getting to know the people. And it was the only opportunity I've really had to go across commodities. I can spend all my time in ornamentals ordinarily, but in the Northeast Division, I would learn from Dave Rosenberger and what he knew about apples and, um, you know, just find out about uh, what Gary Bergstrom had been doing with fusarium in, in uh, field crops. All of these things end up contributing to your ability to solve problems, which is what I really do for a living. Nice. There is another uh, question in chat. Keeping track of current trends is obviously important but difficult for the non-pathologist. And often by the time we see it in the news, it's too late. So are there resources that you would suggest to growers and others to stay up to date with relative uh, with relevant news and outbreaks? Mm 
Uh, well, Victor, I would agree with you that that's a very hard thing to do. Um, locally here on Long Island, I think everyone is perhaps a bit spoiled because there's an extremely active and functional cooperative extension and they make sure that everybody knows about new things. Um, in a more countrywide fashion in the greenhouse industry, there's a uh, system known as eGrow, which is a communication system that puts out information that's extension information as soon as the individuals involved find out about it and have a message for growers. And so a free subscription to that is a good example of knowing about plant problems as soon as someone can tell you what they really are. Um, and I, I think my simple answer to the question is probably to be connected to Cooperative Extension because that is your main source of that kind of information. A grower probably is going to learn things from uh, gossip at their local um, supplier of fertilizer and, and um, other growing tools. But we don't really have that grower gossip line. We need to have um, the communications that flow through Cooperative Extension. And if there isn't a strong extension where you are, connect into one in a, a state that does it well. Uh, make sure you're getting their newsletters. Make sure you're you're hearing about things through some sort of organized, academically connected information source, so that it's it's uh, relevant way above the level of actual gossip level gossip. Um, it's it's hard to talk about the new problems until you understand them a little bit. But once there's been an identification of a pathogen, then um, plant pathologists can help you understand the the things that follow from what's known. Uh, last year, for example, there was a virus identified that um, is in the Tabamo virus group. And it was a brand new virus, but if you asked the right people, they could tell you what to anticipate because they knew it was in the Tabamo virus family. And those sorts of connections really help you get the basics out to growers fairly quickly. But um, I Again, we're we're a little bit blessed in New York with a really strong extension service. I, I think we stay better informed than many. Uh, Neil has a question. Uh, it's a great question about global trade, which is critical to the industry, um, but it brings in diseases as well. Oh boy. Yeah. And that's <laughs> that's the big question, really. So um I'm one of the people who was trained in an earlier era where the terminology of clean stock was considered somewhat sacred. Um, this was developed um, by some of the greats that some of you folks would know, the um, um, Jim Tammons and um, Bob Ogilvies and Ken Hurst of, of that era. And they learned that you could take a crop that was not very reliable, like geraniums, and you could make it very reliable by having just a very good sanitation system built into its production so that when growers purchased cuttings, they didn't have to be terrified about what might be inside them because they were checked and double checked. Um, there can still be mistakes even with that kind of a system, but it's a lot better than having a system where cuttings are taken here and there and no one checks on them, no one looks to see what's inside them before they start selling them. So um, I think this kind of thing is the bottom line idea behind what we need to do with global trade. Um, the governmental inspection groups with APHIS have set up, particularly for geraniums, a really careful inspection system where they track material from individual stock plants all the way through to the final customer who might be in the United States. So if a problem arises, they can tra trace it right back and eliminate the source of the problem and understand the source of the problem. It does seem to need activity on the part of our regulatory folks in the other countries where cuttings are produced. And that business has become huge as, as Neil's alluding to. It's the way we can have cuttings as propagules because it would be too expensive to use them if they were developed in this country with our labor costs. So there's, there's a lot of production in places where they have standards, but if we go in as American regulatory folks and say, well, we have these standards and they might be a little higher than yours, but if you want to sell to our country, you have to maintain this level of perfection, then I think that will work. Um, it's certainly necessary when you have things like viruses where there may not be any symptom expression at all at the point uh, when the plants are brought in. 
um, you need inspection programs looking for at least the, the most serious problems we know to date. And um, I also would advocate for having some of the old fashioned methods too. The um, modern methods of using PCR for identification, for example, are, are superb when they work. But um, this goes back to what Adam was asking about. Uh, when a company was using PCR to look for the xanthomonads they knew about, they were missing a new one. And um, only by using some of the more old fashioned techniques of culturing, for example, do you notice a new problem and gain the ability to, to follow up on it and find out um, whether you can control it and all those important things. So I, I'd like to see um, both very efficiently run government programs that help on the other side of the globe, um, along with um, having everyone look for the unknown at the same time that they look for the known. Because I think in modern science, we tend to be so efficient at looking for the known that we sometimes miss the unknowns and we're continually finding new things still. So I'd, I'd like to see that combination of, of approaches and um, it's expensive, but that will ensure the quality that will allow us to keep growers in business without bringing in a lot of bad things all the time. We can't really afford that because they, they lose their crops. That fits, I think, perfectly, Marjorie, into Gillian's question, uh, which I think is fantastic. That I know there's a bunch of students online about the importance of Koch's postulates. Yeah, um, and yeah. then, and then, if you could uh, finish up by, I think, uh, I think everyone would love to hear your thoughts on the importance, the strategic importance of having an ornamentals pathologist, the location that you are, and just, just highlight the what we feel is the critical role that an ornamentals pathologist can play um, here in New York. Great, love to answer that question, and I, I like the Cook's question too. <laughs> <laughs> so the, um, first of all, the Cook's postulate question. The, the quick answer is. Um, anytime anyone wants to publish, they'll do Koch's postulates. Uh, but that's not all the time because everyone's in a hurry. And um, sometimes the people who have the problem don't have the resources of a greenhouse, such as I have, and the time, which I don't necessarily have, um, to work out the, the really distinct relationship between something you suspect and the actual cause of symptoms that you see in a crop. Um, your average diagnostic laboratory, although a wonderful thing, usually does not stop and do Koch's postulates on uh, any but the most unusual and scary samples that they might bring in because it, it takes time and it takes resources that they may not have. So um, I think it's a rarity, but it's very important. And absolutely, if you ever expect that a disease might not be one that you've heard of before. If it doesn't fit the syndrome that's presented in the literature, um, check into it, sequence the pathogen, see if it fits, uh, learn more about it because it, it really drives me crazy when people are sitting on a new problem and don't realize it. And um, accusing the wrong thing of being the cause is also a, a large sin. So if you don't do Koch's postulates, and ensure that you're really dealing with the pathogen, you could be getting the answer wrong. Um, absolutely. So um, let me let me go from that. Let's see, there's one other question I'll end on Chris's question. Uh, will metagenomics approaches eventually replace many general plant pathologists? And uh, the need for diagnosticians who perform standard diagnostics for known suspects using PCR-based approaches. Yeah, this is the kind of evolution we're facing now, right? Um, as a member of the old guard, I would like to see some of the basic handle a plant once in a while, do Koch's postulates every time uh, it looks important um, approach, rather than purely just looking at the genetics, because I think it's too big a world out there. And we don't have databases at this point that are good enough or reliable enough that we're always going to get the right answer um, through even the very elegant molecular approaches that we can do today. So I'd like to see us keeping some of the expertise that is so special that you find in a diagnostic lab where somebody has seen a lot and can apply um, their knowledge from previous cases to the current case and can look at the big picture and think about, well, gee, maybe it's just a fertilizer problem. We don't have to find a pathogen here. 
Um, you just need some of that experiential approach to diagnosis that we'll lose if we go into nothing but what genes are there. So uh, I, I should just give Karen the floor. She'd probably have a lot to say on this too. <laughs> but um, but that's, that's my feeling on it. And I, I would like to see diagnostics evolving where we take advantage of all the metagenomics approaches that are available to us, but that we not lose some of the historical and experiential aspects that I think are terribly important too. And then um, finally, Chris, I guess the, the, I'll go back to saying we're spoiled here. Long Island has a lot of ornamentals producers and they are all very grateful to us here at LIHREC for what we provide to them because if they think they're seeing something unusual, they bring it to us and we diagnose it. And if we need help from other scientists and other places who might have more of a genetic approach to working with it, we've been able to find that for them. Uh, I can take it to Melanie and, and uh, Adam and beautiful music can be made. So the, there's a system here that works so well for our growers and they're very, they're top notch growers because they wouldn't be able to function on Long Island if they weren't. It's expensive to grow here, just like it's expensive to live here. So um, I think that everyone here sees how nice it is to produce crops when you've got a Cornell connection to understanding what goes wrong when it goes wrong. Um, we've got connection to Neil Madsen when we have uh, any kind of a, a um, abiotic type of problem. We've got connections to John Sanderson and Dan Gilrain here for entomological things. We've got a lot of different skills brought into one uh, working unit, many of whom are physically located here, and that works very well for us. So um, when I was preparing um, this talk and just everything I've done in the past few years, I keep running across names of Cornelians, and um, there have been so many who contributed to the knowledge that we have now. Um, you heard Dickey a little while ago. That was Bob Dickey. You know, we knew Bob Dickey. You know, there's there's been this fantastic tradition of people contributing to ornamentals pathology from Cornell. And it's a, a unique area because of the wide range of different plants that it serves. But it also is terribly important because there's a lot of money in it. And many people all over the United States are involved in the production and they need answers quickly. They have millions of dollars in their crops. And it's not all written down because often the crop they're growing is different from the one they grew last year. So it's a faster moving area of agriculture uh, than the ones that might be dealing with soybean problems or corn problems, let's say. Um, so I, I really like to see the infrastructure stay at Cornell to address the problems that affect the ornamental plants. Um, and I'm, I'm doing everything I can to, to help with that. We're, we're trying a bit of an angle of calling it urban because yes, the people who use ornamental plants often are the more urban people. Um, but I think the, the core understanding at the bottom of all that language is just that we need someone to continue this great tradition of ornamentals pathology. And I'm gonna keep doing it for a while myself. So uh, <laughs> I'll do what I can. Thank you, Marjorie. And I think to wrap it up, Bill Miller said it brilliantly. Not only is Marjorie a national treasure, but an international treasure as well. So to the committee members, uh, Neil, we know you're headed off, but uh, Marjorie and Mark, we will uh, hop on Zoom on the next link, maybe at 1120. And Marjorie, you'll hop on that link as well. And thank you so much, Marjorie, for a wonderful seminar. Thank you all for listening. So long. Thanks, Marjorie. And that this has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.